Wonderful singing so far tonight, and um, great time of worship to the Lord. Um, hope to continue that here and now as we get into God's Word. Um, we'll be picking up exactly where we left off last time I preached, uh, just moving into the next chapter, uh, and should consider it that way. These are not the chapter breaks weren't originally there to begin with. Um, and so before we uh, get into it, let's uh, pray. Our Father in heaven, we pray and ask for uh, your help and guidance uh, as we preach here, Lord. Uh, pray for the hearts that will hear, Lord, that brothers and sisters would be strengthened and encouraged in the faith, that they would be instructed and, and built up that any unbelieving among us tonight, that they might have the truth of your word revealed to them, that they would see the law condemning us and pointing us to the cross, to faith in Christ, that they would see Christ. Lord, I pray for your help as I uh, see and know I am inadequate to fulfill this, uh, to fulfill this task myself, Lord. Uh, please guide and instruct me. This we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, we were in uh, 1 John chapter 1 last time. We are in 1 John chapter 2 now. Uh, we will, because the second chapter is a little bit longer, only be getting into the first few verses here. Uh, but sufficient for us. Where we left off last time, John was... Um, well, throughout the entirety of his book, is that he is addressing a uh, false teaching that had become prevalent in his time, a false teaching that continues to be prevalent even in our time, Gnosticism, which, when it boils down to it, most false teachings, most cults, actually at some point get into Gnosticism, this idea of giving people a secret, hidden knowledge. Um, we would adhere to the fact that God's Word is sufficient for us, and that's where John drives us again and again in his epistle. Um, the main point we focused on, though, was on that verse in chapter 5, verse 13, last time, uh, that, that one of the reasons John is writing this epistle is to the believer's assurance of faith. And the antithesis of that is that a unbeliever would hereby thoroughly be revealed that they are not truly a believer through these tests that John gives us. And so in the first chapter, we looked at the first two tests, uh, that of a correct understanding of who Jesus is and that of a correct understanding of who we are before God, before conversion, our need of, of a Savior, our, our sinfulness. And so picking up right where we left off, remembering the context, John says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Um, John, in writing this, gives another reason for writing the epistle, is that you may not sin. He's writing this to instruct and to encourage brothers and sisters so that we would not fall into a trap of Satan. Um, the, as, as I mentioned before, he was dealing with the Gnostic heretics of the time. Uh, many of these tests not only can be applied to a believer, but they can also be applied to any teacher of the Word of God. That if you see these things present in a false or in a teacher, it means they're a false teacher. Um, boiling it down to us, though, we can see uh, this is a warning against presumption. We best not presume upon God's grace, saying uh, it's okay for me to continue on in this willful, wanton sin uh, because I have grace. Uh, John makes it clear in this verse and in the following verses, which we're going to be studying tonight, uh, that the correct response to God's amazing grace is not flippant sinning, but instead is obedience flowing from a regenerate heart. Uh, John here as well, though, even in this verse, we're giving that warning against presumption, uh, mingles in, in in beautiful proportions, uh, promise to the true believer that if we do sin, that we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus ever stands pleading for us before the throne of God. That though we have the accuser constantly trying to malign us, which that's 
what Satan means, that is Hebrew for accuser or adversary. He is constantly um, against us, but we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Uh, propitiation is a beautiful word, and I believe I remember from Brother Jim, it's his favorite word. <laughs> it means satisfaction. Uh, it conveys the idea of a legal payment being made in full, that Jesus has perfectly, completely paid the sin debt of those who trust and rest in Him. There is now no longer a debt that stands between God and those who are in Christ. There is no enmity. There is no um, war. There is no hatred. He has brought peace now between God and those who are in Him. <clears throat> in this, uh, we would be amiss not to dive into this. Uh, this is a verse that can be taken out of context. Uh, we don't have in view here an idea of universalism. That Jesus did not die so that everyone in this world could be saved and go to heaven without ever coming to faith in Christ. Jesus made it clear that the way is broad, which leads to destruction. The way is narrow, which leads to life. And on the last day, there will be many who stand before Him and proclaim, uh, Did we not prophesy in Your name? Did we not do many wonderful, mighty works in Your name? Did we not cast out demons in Your name? And He'll say, How could you? I never knew you. These will go away into everlasting torment, Jesus says. And those on the right hand of Jesus, he said, will go into eternal life. So, the idea of universalism is right out. Secondarily, we could see here uh, an idea that some might have of a uh, universal atonement. Um, to make it, uh, to get it out of the big theological terms, the idea that Jesus died on the cross only to provide the potential for salvation to everyone in general. I don't believe that's in view here either. We have that in um, uh, John 4, that those whom the Father has given me, they will come to me. Or not John 4, John 6 rather. Uh, instead, what we have here is that Jesus is the propitiation to all kinds from this world. John is, not saying that he is, John is saying that He's not just the Savior of the Jews. He's not just the Savior of those of us who have faith in Christ right now, but He is the Savior of all who will come to Him in faith and repentance. He is the Savior of that numberless multitude that we see in Revelation 7 out of every kindred, tribe, tongue, people, and nation who through His grace are saved, regenerated by the Holy Spirit, brought to faith in Christ, elected before the foundation of the world. These are who John is speaking of here. It's been said this way that Jesus' work, His propitiation is sufficient for all and efficient for the elect. Uh, these are things not to quarrel about or to fight about among believers, but these are things to take comfort in as a believer. Uh, you who maybe are heartbroken because you see that your family members, your friends, your loved ones, your, uh, you, you see that they have not responded to the gospel yet. You might be tempted to lose heart in proclaiming the gospel to them. Do not lose heart. You who are troubled because you see your loved ones enslaved by wicked passions, uh, your children, your husband or wife, your mother or father, your, your friends or siblings, your neighbors, don't be troubled. Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to Him through faith. There is no such thing as someone who is too lost for Jesus to save. There is no such thing as someone too wicked for Jesus to save. So for us as believers, we need to earnestly plead with these loved ones. We need to give them the gospel. We need to continue to, to first give them the law, which shows them their need of a gospel. Um, and their starting position, they're going to be like those we talked about in the first chapter who see that there is no problem. They see that they are not sinners. They are they're basically good people. They will not need a Savior until we show them they need a Savior. They will uh, protest that they do not need medicine until they know that they are sick. 
And we must be like the poor widow our Lord speaks of in the parable of the unjust judge. As the Lord says in that, or as it says in that parable, He told them a parable to this effect that they should always pray and not lose heart. And He told this parable of a, of a widow who kept pleading with this unjust judge who regarded neither God nor man until He finally got tired of her and gave her justice. Jesus was not saying that God is like this judge, but He's saying that God is much better than this judge. He is so far greater than this judge. And if he is so much far greater than this judge, he will provide for his people. He will, he will fulfill those, those desires that are according to his will, that he will grant that petition. We mustn't lose heart. We must always be praying for those. How then can we know that we know him? Verse 3, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. <clears throat> Remember, as we said last time, this is not about sinless perfection. This is about the direction of one's life, the pattern of one's life, the overarching scheme of your life. Uh, we know that we are his when we keep his commandments. This is a visible evidence of what we already have uh, in, in these first two uh, tests, the first two tests there in, in the first chapter. Uh, this one is the first one that becomes a visible outpouring in our lives. Uh, you may say, but I don't always keep His commandments. Does this trouble you? Are you bothered that you don't keep His commandments always? Is your remaining sin the greatest sorrow that you endure in this life? Would you be rid of sin entirely and follow Him perfectly? Remember, it's direction, not perfection. The fact that you desire to serve Jesus and that there's growth and progress and obedience, love, holiness, and faith in your life is evidence that you are a child of God. Yet, verse 4, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. We can know that if there is no obedience at all in your life, John makes it clear you're a liar. The truth is not in you. You profess to know Christ, but you deny Him by your works. And so the third test is obedience. Obedience to God's commands. The person who says they're a Christian and refuses to obey Christ is lying. I'd have a better time believing someone who says they're an American soldier, but says they take their orders from someone in North Korea. And ultimately, it boils down to this, verse 5. But whoever keeps his word in him truly, the love of God is perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. It boils down to this. It, it, this is, uh, in, in test one, we had an orthodox understanding of who Jesus is. For me to love Jesus... I must know who He is. I must have the right understanding of who Jesus is. Uh, the second test, that I must know my sin and my need of a Savior. I cannot love Christ if I am disavowing and disregarding and discrediting the work He has done to save me. And test three is obedience. I cannot say that I love God if I am disobeying Him. Constantly disobeying Him. Living in disobedience. If I do not listen to and obey His Word, I make it clear I don't love Him. Could a wife be taken seriously if she claims to love her husband but disregards and maligns everything the man says, refuses to regard anything of him, um, treats him as little, uh, of little, little value before those around her? Disregard for Christ's commands or disregard for Him? Genuine love for Christ will always be manifested in obedience. <clears throat> and the more I love Him, the more I will obey Him. Uh, but we can't get the cart before the horse either. This is not a pretense to obedience to try to earn God's favor. Uh, that's an easy, easy one to fall into. 
This is a obedience, as I mentioned before, flowing out of a heart that's been regenerated, a heart that is changed, an obedience that, that conforms to God's will, that, that, that agrees with God. And because of what He has done, because of His love, Uh, obedience in any other form, which really there is only other, one other form which isn't really even true obedience at all. It's obedience to try to merit favor with God, and that is just as bad as disobedience. It's obedience to try to lift yourself up by your bootstraps and, and proclaim yourself as someone great, and I don't need that Savior. I can do this myself. And brothers and sisters... Let us watch ourselves that we don't fall into this trap. It's an easy one to do. There's ditches on either side. You can fall into a laxness of presumption on the one side, and you can fall into legalism on the other. You could say, I just fell into a sin, and now, now I need to work my way back to, into God's favor, or I have to really keep up the good works. If I don't keep up the good works, um, God is going to cast me away and disown me. That's impossible. That is never going to happen. If you are truly in Christ, first of all, if you are truly in Christ, you cannot fall out of God's favor. The righteous standing you have before God now is based upon who Jesus is. His righteousness clothes you. You are counted as righteous before God because Jesus is perfectly righteous and you are hidden in Him. <clears throat> the Father has the same favor for you now as He has for the Son, the same love for you now as He has for the Son. He looks upon you as though you were the Son. And it's all because you are hidden in Christ. Secondly, even if you could somehow fall out of favor with God, do you really think you could earn your way back? You didn't earn your way there to begin with. I say this... Uh, <laughs> Saying this to you, mainly needing to say it to myself. This is something that is easy for me to fall into. It's, it's an easy thing that I, I, I feel I cannot come to prayer right now because I, I can't come to God in prayer because I just sinned or I can't study His Word because I just sinned. It's, it's, it's foolish. It's ridiculous. Third and finally, <clears throat> understand the doctrine of adoption. If you are truly in Christ, you are now adopted by the Father. You are united with the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you ever worry uh, that, that your flesh and blood parents would disown you because you're, you're not keeping up with the chores in the, around the house or you're not doing things right or well or you're, you're messing up? Would you worry that your parents are going to disown you? Some of us might have even had hard parents here, but... God is much better than even the best earthly parents. Rest in Christ. You're secure in Christ. And your obedience to God should flow from your love for Him. That love that, that comes from knowing that He, Jesus Christ, the God-man, took your place. You and I, the guilty criminals, he, the righteous and holy God, took our place. The righteous for the unrighteous. The guiltless for the guilty. The immortal for the mortal. Obedience to God will always be present in some degree in a person who is genuinely born again. And this obedience flows out of a heart that adores Jesus. And this obedience is in proportion to your love for Jesus. Jesus. Little love, little obedience. No love, no obedience. Great love, great obedience. Looking again at verse 6, we already read it, but we'll look at it again real quick. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. If we are God's children, we ought to look like him. Um, I mentioned already the, the doctrine of adoption. If this is a reality for you, if you are adopted into the family of God, you will look like Him. You will live like Jesus. Jesus is the... Uh, he is, uh, uh, um, I can't remember exactly where it's at, but He is the express image of the Father. 
he said to um, Philip, have you been with me so long, Philip, and, have you not know, and do you not know me? He that has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is how we know who the Father is. And so for us to look like God, for us to resemble the one who has bought us, we must resemble Christ. This is not a matter of perfection, as I said before. But we will have that trajectory. We will have some of that in our lives. If it is absolutely absent, examine yourself. Check your birth certificate. If there is no likeness to Christ in your life at all, there is no relation to Christ at all. Without resemblance to Christ, you prove yourself to be false in your claim to be a son or daughter. As we begin to conclude here, brothers and sisters, let's examine ourselves. Uh, is there obedience at all in our lives? We need to see that. If there is no obedience at all. An another thing to bear in mind to these tests these tests that John gives, they're, they're not grading on a curve here. Um, you can't make an 80% or a 70% and pass. These are a thing that have to be in every believer. They're not a thing that are in perfection in every believer, but they are a thing that will be even in some sense in a believer, even in a kernel sense in a believer, that it's some small bit there. It'll be there in any kind of believer. But if it's lacking entirely, even in one of these, even if you maybe have something else, a right understanding of who Jesus is, a right understanding of man's sinfulness before Him, but you have no obedience to Christ, or, or you're continuing on in sin constantly, and that's the pattern for your life, you fail the test. Brothers and sisters, too, if obedience is lacking in our lives, we need to ask, am I bothered by it? And if I am bothered by it, what can be done to change that? What can be done to grow me in obedience? The answer is look to the cross. Look to the cross. Look to His commands. As we look to the cross, we will love Him more. As we love Him more, we will want to obey Him more. <clears throat> Remember too, don't fall into the trap that it is, that, that this, is, this obedience is not you trying to maintain favor. This obedience is you because you have God's favor. Because you love Him, obeying Him. This is in response to God's grace. Not a plea to try to obtain God's grace. That's not grace then. It's, it's payment then. It's exaction then. And those who would be here tonight, if in, on examining yourselves, if you've come to see that you fail the test, This is a good place to start. This is start at the beginning there. Have an understanding of who Jesus is, that He is eternal God. He is the God-man. He came and lived and died in our place to buy our pardon. He fulfilled all of God's righteous requirements in our place. And He suffered the wrath that was due to us on the cross. And He calls to us, repent and believe the gospel. Repent. Trust in Him for salvation. Give up your ideas of trying to earn your way through obedience and trust in Christ. Trust and rest in Him. Our Father in heaven, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for amazing grace in Jesus Christ. Um, we pray, help us to take all these things to heart, Lord. Um, humble us, Lord. Help us please to meditate upon these things. And for each and every one of us, um, those of us here who are saved and any who, here who may not be in Christ, that all of us would look long at the cross. That those of us who are in Christ might behold more and more Jesus with unveiled face and be transformed by increasing degree into His likeness. That those who are unbelievers here that looking upon the cross, seeing the cost of their sin, that there at the cross so, so wonderfully meets your justice and your mercy. 
they would see, Lord Jesus, that you truly died there on the cross for them to save them from the sins that they are in, from the wrath which they deserve, to bring them to yourself, to make them a holy and sanctified people. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. And all this we ask, we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.